Welcome to episode 24 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the epic tale of Heracles, with the fourth, fifth, and sixth labors of Heracles. Almost immediately he undertook his fourth quest. It consisted of delivering unharmed to the king a creature also sacred to Artemis. The Arimathean boar, who laid waste the region of the Arimathean mountains. On his journey to these mountains, he stopped with, with Pholos, the son of Selenus. He, like all centaurs, half man and half horse, received his guest's hospitality and set before him roast meat, while he ate his own share of it raw. But when Heracles asked for a good draught to accompany his tasty fare, Pholus said, Dear guest, there is indeed a jar in my cellar, but it belongs to all my people in common, and I have hesitated to have it open, since I know how little regard centaurs have for strangers. Open it without misgivings, Heracles answered. I promise to uh, defend you against all attacks, but I am thirsty." Now Dionysus, the god of wine, had given this jar to a centaur and ordered him not to open it until after four generations had passed, Heracles should visit this region. Pholus then went into the cellar, but hardly had he opened the jar when the centaurs who caught the fragrance of that strong old wine, they gathered and they thronged around the cave of Pholus, armed with boulders and trunks of pines. The first who dared entered Heracles, thrust back with firebrands. The rest he pursued with arrows, even to the promontory of Malaya, where his old friend Chiron lived. Chiron's brother, Centaurs, took refuge with him. Heracles aimed his bow at him and launched a shaft which grazed the arm of one of his foes. But unluckily, it sped on into Chiron's knee, where it stuck fast. Only now did Heracles recognize one who had befriended him in his childhood. He ran to him in grave concern and drew out the arrow and applied those remedies which Chiron, well versed in the art of medicine, had once given him. But the wound was drenched with Hydra's venom and could not be healed. So the centaur had them carry him to his own cave where he wished to die in the arms of his friend. Alas, how vain a wish! Poor Chiron had forgotten that he was immortal and that his agony would last for ever. Heracles bade him farewell with many tears and promised to send death, the liberator, to him, no matter what it cost him. From the story of Prometheus, we know that he kept his word. When Heracles returned to Pholos, he found his gentle host dead in his cave. He had drawn an arrow from the body of one of his brothers, and as he weighed it in his hand, marveling that so small a thing could fell such mighty creatures, the poison dart had slipped from him, grazed his foot, and killed him on the instant. Sorrowfully, Heracles gave him an honorable burial. He laid him under the mountain, which from that time on was called Follow. Then the hero continued on his way to the boar, with ringing bouts to drove him out from the thick underbrush, followed with up the snowy slopes, caught the weary animal with a noose, and brought it to Mycenae alive, as he had been bidden. After this, King Eurystheus sent him off to his fifth labor, which was indeed unworthy of a hero. He was to clean the stables of Aegeus in a single day. Aegeus was the king of Elis and had countless herds of cattle. According to the custom of the ancients, he kept his beast in a great enclosure in front of the palace. Three thousand cattle had been living there for a long time, and so, in the course of years, great piles of dung had accumulated. These Heracles was to clean out in a single day, a task 
which was humiliating for one thing and almost impossible for another. When the demigod stood in the presence of Aegeus and offered to perform this service without, however, mentioning that it was at the command of Eurystheus, the king measured this stalwart youth in his lion skin and could hardly suppress laughter at the thought that so noble a warrior could wish to do the task of a common servant. But he said to himself that the love of gain had already tempted many a brave man and that perhaps this one wanted to enrich himself at the king's expense, that moreover, um, it would not hurt to promise him a substantial reward for cleaning the stables in a day, since there was no doubt whatsoever that he could not accomplish this feat. Therefore, he said confidently, Stranger, if you can indeed clean out all the dung in a day, I shall give you a tenth of my cattle. Heracles accepted the condition, and the king thought he would at once begin to ply the shovel. But after the hero called Phileas, the son of Aegeus, to witness the agreement, he trenched the ground of the cattle yard on one side and let the streams Alpheus and Peneus, which flowed close by, run in through a canal and out through another opening, bearing away with them the entire mass of filth. In this way, he carried out a disgraceful order without degrading himself to service which would be unworthy of an immortal. When Aegeus learned that Heracles had done this thing at the command of Eurystheus, he not only refused to pay the reward, but denied ever having promised it. However, he agreed to let a court decide the matter. When the judges were assembled, Phileas appeared at Heracles' demand, bore witness against his own father, and declared that it was true that he had promised Heracles a reward. Aegeus did not wait to hear the judgment. In high dungeon, he bade both the stranger and his son leave his kingdom in an instant. After other adventures, Heracles returned to Eurystheus, who declared that the labor he had just performed did not count because he had asked for payment. The king at once sent him forth on a sixth quest to drive away the Stymphalian birds. Now, they were birds of prey as large as cranes and armed with iron wings, beaks, and claws. They nested around Lake Stymphalian in Arcadia and had the power of launching their feathers like shafts and piercing even a brazen cuirass with their beaks. Throughout that region they had destroyed countless men and beasts. It was they that had troubled the heroes of Argo. After a short journey, Heracles reached the lake, which lay in the shadow of tall trees. A large flock of the birds had just fled to these words for fear of becoming the prey of wolves. Heracles stood there helplessly, wondering how he could master a foe which appeared in such vast numbers, when suddenly he felt a light tap on his shoulder, and turning saw the majestic form of Pallas Athene. She gave him two enormous rattles of bronze which Hephaestus had made for her, instructed him to use these against the Stymphalian birds, and vanished from his sight. Heracles climbed a mountain near the lake and frightened the birds by shaking the giant rattles. Not for long could they endure the strident sound. Stricken with terror, they flew out from their shelter of the trees, and Heracles gripped his bow and shot one after another in flight. The rest left the region, never to return. And here I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.